and can I just welcome everyone to the 22nd meeting in 2018 of the Eclair Committee. Um, and we have apologies this morning from Graham Day, from Alec Neil, and Richard Lyle. Um, before we move to the first item on the agenda, I would like to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones as they may affect the broadcasting system. Can I also advise members we will move to committee room three uh, to consider the third item on the agenda. Uh, I should begin also by uh, declaring an interest um, as, a, as a former. Um, so agenda item one is d a decision on taking business in private. And the first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take item three in private. Shall we take item three in private? Agreed. Thank you very much. We're all agreed. Um, agenda item two is the implication for Scotland of the UK's departure from the European Union. These are the environmental implications. Um, and we are delighted uh, this morning to hear evidence via a video link uh, from Michael Gove, MP, uh, Secretary of State for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs in the UK Government, on the environmental principles and implications for Scotland of the UK departure from the EU. So, good morning, uh, Mr Gove, Michael. Um, thank you for taking the time uh, to speak to us via this video link this morning. Uh, we are very grateful uh, to you for doing so. Um, because time is, is very limited, um, I think it's already been agreed that we'll just move straight to questions. And the first question is from Finlay Carson this morning. Mr Carson. Uh, there's a politically driven message in this place that there's little or unsatisfactory level of engagement between our two governments. So just to put it on the record, can you tell us what procedures DEFRA has put in place to ensure effective engagement with the Scottish Government on Brexit? Well, I meet regularly with representatives of the Scottish Government, and I have to say um, that the, uh, the warmth of the relationship between myself and Rosanna Cunningham and Fergus Ewing um, on an operational level uh, belies what you might hear about some of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the political tensions that are supposed to exist. Um, I saw Fergus informally just last week at the Royal Highland Show, but um, uh, every month to six weeks we have formal meetings with the UK government and representatives of all the devolved administrations to discuss all the issues that fall within our respective remits. Um, and at those meetings, I have to say, uh, there is very rarely a crossword, and I have to commend the constructive and pragmatic way that the Scottish government, its officials and its ministers engage um, with the day-to-day the -day pragmatic business of government. OK, just on the back of that, what sort of information does DEFRA share with the Scottish government to uh, help us enable plan for life after Brexit? We do everything we can to share um, all the information that we can. And so, for example, we share draft clauses with uh, uh, the, the Scottish and the Welsh governments for future legislation. We try to give uh, the, uh, the Scottish government and the other devolved administrations advanced sight of uh, white papers or command papers. Um, and it's also the case that when it comes to drafting secondary legislation, we try as much as possible to share uh, not just the, the broad outlines, but the working detail. Now, of course, sometimes... Uh, as is natural between governments, as is natural sometimes between government departments. Um, people would prefer to have slightly more time and slightly more detail, but uh, uh, as a general rule, I've uh, instructed my department to, be, uh, to lean in and to share as much information as possible as early as possible, and indeed we've benefited on occasions from advice that we've had. Um, I'll mention just one thing in particular, which is not really a controversial bill, um, the bill to uh, ban the sale of ivory, um, which is making its way through the House of Commons, uh, we had very good engagement with the, uh, the Scottish Government on that. They are you know, on the same page as us and wanting this legislation to be brought forward on a, a UK-wide basis. Um, and they made us aware of one or two potential constitutional wrinkles, but we worked collectively to iron those out. OK, thank you for putting that on record. Um, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have... Got the next question, uh, Mr Gove, and can I ask you what uh, progress is being made on the negotiations uh, for the areas within the committee's remit that will require uh, a UK legislative framework? Um, this is really you know, the area for, for policy frameworks that we're wanting to inquire about and how, how you see that emerging and developing. 
Well, as, as I think Mike Russell will have informed uh, the committee in a different context, there have been a number of deep dives, um, uh, i.e. very close, collaborative, thoughtful uh, engagement at an official level um, in, the, in the areas for which um, my department and um, Fergus's and Rosanna's departments are responsible, because we wanted to ensure that there are UK-wide frameworks in a number of areas. So when it comes to environmental principles overall, um, we accepted at a previous meeting um, of the UK government and devolved administrations a sort of draft text on a guiding approach that had actually been drafted by uh, Leslie Griffiths on behalf of the Welsh Government with support from Rosanna. And, and we were very, very happy with that as just a sort of rules of the road guide to help us to shape those frameworks. And I think when it comes to the environment overall, um, all four uh, administrations um, are um, uh, more or less in the same Position. We all want to ensure that as we leave the European Union, there's no diminution in the protection that the environment has. Thank you. Um, what, in your view, uh, is the, the nature and scope of the UK legislative framework for the implementation of the EU, trade, EU emissions trading system? How are we getting on with that? Well, the, the emissions trading system is principally a, a, an area that falls within the remit of the business, energy and industrial strategy uh, team. So, um, I, again, I, I, I wouldn't want to say too much at this stage because it's properly a matter for my colleagues Claire Perry and Greg Clark, and I wouldn't want to uh, trespass onto their territory, but there's nothing that I'm aware of uh, which is uh, an obstacle or an impediment to, to good working between the UK government and the DAs. But if for any reason, um, and I'll go from obviously this hearing to check with my colleagues at Bayes, if for any reason there are uh, difficulties, then of course I will write to your committee to let you know what those might be and what we're doing in order to overcome them. Thank you. Uh, can you talk a little bit about waste packaging and product regulations, uh, please, and tell us how you're developing um, your thinking in that area? Absolutely. Um, we hope to have a waste and resources strategy published, UK government waste and resources strategy published in uh, uh, the autumn. One of the things that we've uh, sought to do is to learn from Scotland and in particular Wales. Wales has very, very high uh, levels of recycling and um, uh, there are uh, lessons that we in England can learn from them about how we can drive up recycling rates overall. But it's also the case that, as well as recycling, we have ambitions uh, as a UK government to have a deposit return scheme. Um, and again, it was the case that the Scottish government um, was out of the traps earlier in outlining the importance of a DRS. We want to work collaboratively with all of the uh, devolved administrations in order to ensure that a deposit return scheme works effectively. Because while, of course, recycling happens uh, at, a, at a local government uh, level. If you're going to have a DRS scheme, you would want to, we would want to make sure that uh, uh, there weren't any discontinuities at the border between Scotland and England that meant that the operation of that scheme was somehow uh, less than, than smooth. Right, thank you very much uh, again for that. And um, now I'll move to the next question. Uh, Angus MacDonald, please. Hey, thanks. Um, convener, good morning, Mr Gove. If I could just briefly continue on the deposit return uh, theme. Um, you'll be aware, possibly, Mr Gove, that uh, this morning the Scottish Government uh, launched a public consultation on the design of, of such a scheme. So, given the, the strong public support and the environmental importance of, of reducing plastic pollution overall, um, can you assure the committee that you're doing everything you can to support <coughs> the Scottish Government in its work? And are there any discussions ongoing between the UK, Scottish and indeed the Welsh governments on, on system design and timing? Yes, absolutely. Um, well, firstly, you're, you're, you're right. There is widespread public concern about uh, plastic waste and the, uh, the tide of toxic plastic that finds its way into our rivers and our oceans. And all the governments of the United Kingdom are united in recognising that we need to work individually and together to deal with it. Um, and, of course, the Scottish Government, as I, as I mentioned very briefly earlier, but let me put it on record, was brave and right in uh, stressing that a deposit return scheme uh, would be um, an important part of resolving uh, this issue. And uh, we've been working, uh, uh, I think, uh, collaboratively uh, with uh, Rosanna Cunningham and with um, the Welsh Government as well in order to make sure that we can uh, ensure that uh, the proposals that Scotland brings forward um, dovetail with the proposals that we'll introduce in the rest of the United Kingdom. 
Okay, thanks. Um, the, the new EU targets for recycling of packaging, particularly from plastic, uh, are more ambitious than is currently being achieved. Um, do you agree that an ambitious deposit return scheme will be needed to achieve these targets, and do you agree that it will be, need to be comprehensive uh, in relation to plastic drinks containers? Because we're hearing rumours that you're looking at uh, simply a, an on-the-go uh, deposit return scheme. Well, I wouldn't want to preempt our own consultation, but we do believe, yes, that you do need to be, my own view is, the more comprehensive, the better. I think you're absolutely right. And I think that, um, you know, we're, we're all aware, um, and you quite rightly remind us of the need to be aware of the, the scale of ambition required in order to deal with this problem, that uh, our reliance on plastic um, at, uh, uh, you know, uh, across our economy is something that does need to be tackled. A deposit return scheme is a critical way of making sure that as consumers and as producers, um, all of us can play our part in making sure that we, we deal with the, uh, the pollution and waste problems that our reliance on plastic has generated. Yeah, and with regard to the circular economy package that the EU has adopted, um, with regard to increasing targets for recycling, is the UK government committed to achieving at least th these standards uh, and targets, even if Brexit means that they're no longer binding on the UK? Yes, absolutely. Um, we uh, committed ourselves to the higher level of ambition that the EU has committed itself to. And one of the things that I, uh, I would say is that um, uh, we wanted to make sure that outside the European Union, as I said uh, earlier, there is no diminution in our commitment to environmental protection. Indeed, in some areas, we believe that there is the potential to go further. OK, that's good to hear. Um, if I could, uh, I'm aware of the time constraints, convener, so if um, I could explore the environmental quality non-legislative common frameworks. Um, can you tell the committee what progress has been made in the development of uh, the non-legislative frameworks for environmental issues such as air quality, biodiversity and waste management? Well, in all of these areas, the, the work is going on between... Um, uh, my department and between the devolved administrations. When it comes to air quality, we published, um, I, I hope people will recognise, an ambitious uh, uh, aim to uh, ensure that across the UK, and we uh, end reliance on uh, the internal combustion engine, that there will be no new conventional petrol or diesel cars sold um, after 2040, and they'll all be off the road with one or two unique exemptions by 2050. I know that the Scottish Government has a higher level of ambition there, um, and we would applaud any country that wants to have a higher level of ambition, but we've created what we believe is an effective backdrop against which uh, all the countries of the United Kingdom can, can make progress. Um, and in, in the other areas that you mentioned as well, we believe that it's necessary to have effective collaboration. Uh, it's in all our interests. And there are, no, um, there are no issues of principle between us. You know, there may be some other areas where um, our respective governments might have a, a divergent view about what the right future should be, but on all the matters that you mentioned and the broader environmental uh, agenda, um, I don't think that there is any real difference or divergence between the ambitions of the Scottish, Welsh and the UK governments. OK, you, you mentioned uh, uh, the possibility of divergent views. Um, how, will, how do you see disputes being resolved? Well, I think that one of the things that we're resolving at the moment is uh, the, the means by which uh, we can ensure that uh, we respect the fact that the environment is a, is a totally devolved competence. And one of the things that um, uh, the establishment of these frameworks and the collaborative way in which we establish these frameworks is setting out to do is to respect and strengthen the devolution framework. There's not a single power uh, that the Scottish Government exercises that we want to remove from them, quite the opposite. Uh, we see the potential outside the European Union for uh, each of the individual parts of the, the United Kingdom, as well as collaborating together, also to make the decisions that they believe are right for their own particular jurisdiction. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr MacDonald. Uh, Mark Ruskell has got a supplementary question in this area. Thank you. Could I ask you about the frameworks that are being developed in relation to trade negotiations and how they may impact on environmental standards? Because it's clear that the government seems to have two different ways it could go on this. In your own DEFRA consultation, uh, you talk about maintaining high standards, and yet when I read the UK government's economic impact assessment on Brexit, it talks about a deregulatory agenda in relation to consumer protection and the environment. So you know, which one is it? And how do we ensure that devolved administrations and indeed your own parliament is able to scrutinise what comes out of any trade deal? 
Well, I think it would be the case that uh, no, uh, that any trade deal that's secured would have to make its own way through the House of uh, Commons. Um, and I think it's also the case that uh, the involvement of uh, the devolved administrations in making sure that we get the right trade deal um, is central. Um, the thing I would say is that the, 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 the tension that um, uh, you describe, I don't believe is there. Um, we have been clear at a UK government level, and I don't think this is a, a view that's very different from the view of the Scottish or the Welsh governments, that we absolutely need to maintain high environmental standards, and for that matter, high animal welfare standards, in any trade deal that we conclude. And it's not just that we want to do that because it's right morally, it's also um, uh, the pragmatic economic thing to do, because um, Britain will succeed uh, in the future and uh, the individual nations of the United Kingdom will succeed in the future on the basis that the products that we produce are known worldwide for the high quality standards that lie behind them. Um, and there's no future for the United Kingdom in trying to uh, lead some sort of race to the bottom. The future for us economically is being um, the, the home of quality, whether that's in the food and drink that we produce or also in the uh, uh, areas like, for example, um, ultra-low emission vehicles, which effective, targeted and tough regulation can help sustain. Does that mean that environmental standards then should be off the table in relation to trade negotiations? It means that environmental standards have to be maintained in the course of trade negotiations. Absolutely, they do need to be defended. And one of the things that uh, we need to be clear with our, um, our trading partners is that, of course, Free trade brings many, many benefits, but we don't believe that uh, in order to secure the benefits of free trade, that you should trade away environmental protection. Is that a view that's shared across government? Yes. OK. OK. Right. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Ruskell. I now move to Donald Cameron for the next question. Mr Cameron. Thank you, Convener. Um, Mr Gove, I'd like to continue asking about UK-wide frameworks, but perhaps with a slightly longer-term view. Um, what what UK wide processes of collaboration do you envisage might be needed in the future? Um, for example, when dealing with changes to international obligations going forward. Well, I think that uh, it's absolutely critical that we make sure that all the constituent nations of the United Kingdom feel that uh, their interests are effectively represented, and we have, as I say, at Defra at the moment, uh, uh, what started as an informal arrangement, which is now becoming um, a, an integral part of our way of working, an integral part, I think, of uh, the Scottish, Welsh and um, Northern Ireland government's ways of working. Um, and I think that whether it's through the Joint Ministerial Committee structure or whether it's through the, uh, the structures that we ourselves have set up, the most important thing is to make sure that we operate with um, uh, courtesy towards each other, that we share as much information as possible. And we also recognise that the work that has been undertaken by the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster and the UK Cabinet Office in order to ensure that we can um, resolve some of these issues in a uh, civilised way uh, bears fruit. OK, thank you, uh, Mr Cameron. I have now moved to Finlay Carson as a series of questions. Mr Carson. Thank you. Um, I would like to move on to funding, uh, Mr Gove. The executive summary of the, the, food, uh, the future of food, farming and environment sets out a funding guarantee to replace CAP um, it, it maintains the same cash total funding uh, for, the, uh, for farm support under both Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 of the, of the current cap. I, I'm going to ask three questions on the back of that. Uh, does the UK Government funding guarantee cover uh, funding for uh, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 in their entirety? And will replacement funding be based on annual averages or spending projections? Uh, and within that, does the, the funding guarantee cover payments under multi-annual agreements with land managers uh, to be made after 2022? Well, the, the first thing is that the, the funding guarantee um, is that uh, it does cover Pillars 1 and Pillar 2. It covers it right up until 2022. And it is also the case that if we have entered into contracts with land managers and those contracts extend until after 2022, then they will be honoured, yes. OK, and will that be based on annual averages or spending projections? I'll have to come back to you on that because we haven't uh, definitively, uh, what's the word, ruled on that issue. OK, thank you. OK, Any, right, thank you very much. Um, now move to Mr Rowley. Uh, I'll let Rowley 
Okay, I think earlier, Mr Gove, you said that there would be not a single power removed from the devolved administrations, but you are aware that there is concern in Scotland which has been described as a, as a power grab uh, by, by the UK government, and many of these powers are around the uh, environment. Uh, so what would your view be to those who say that there, there is this power grab taking place and that powers that should be coming back here are not coming back to this parliament? Well, I, I, people do talk about the, the, the so-called power grab, but I haven't seen anyone enumerate a single power that uh, the UK government wants to uh, exercise, which involves taking power back from uh, the Scottish government or the Scottish parliament. Quite the opposite. Um, I have absolutely no desire to uh, exercise powers which are currently exercised by um, Rosanna Cunningham or any of her colleagues in the Scottish Government. Um, and um, uh, the, the case is made that that's what the UK Government wants to do. I don't know a single UK uh, Government Minister sitting around the UK Cabinet table who wants to take a power away from uh, the Scottish Government. No one's ever identified one. In terms of, the, I mean, the UK government, I know, have suggested that there could be a, indeed a significant increase uh, and, and devolved autonomy in certain areas, and in particular in relation to the environment. Do you do you have any view on where you would see uh, more powers and more autonomy coming to the Scottish Parliament in relation to the environment? Well, it is the case that uh, uh, the environment is fully devolved. Agriculture and fisheries do too. There are of course, UK frameworks um, that we will need to have on agriculture and fisheries to make sure that um, uh, uh, Scotland's producers um, uh, have the opportunity to have the same unfettered access to consumers in England that they do at the moment. Um, but I can foresee circumstances where, as Fergus Ewing was hinting last week, um, uh, he decides to develop support for Scotland's farmers um, in a different way from the way in which we do so south of the border. And it could be the case that there are other um, uh, areas of environmental innovation or ambition and we we're talking about a deposit return scheme earlier. We've also been talking about Scotland's desire to um, move further and faster in supporting ultra low emission vehicles. Of course, it helps if we all work and move together on the environment because um, uh, you know our air knows no boundaries. We're bounded by the same seas. So it's important that we recognise how critical it is to work together. But one of the things that I would say is that Rosanna Cunningham, when it comes to, for example, uh, the restoration of um, uh, or the reintroduction of um, um, native species has been, uh, you know, thoughtful in thinking about uh, some of the ways in which Scotland could go further, faster. Um, I, uh, I applaud that level of ambition and would never want to do anything other than to encourage the Scottish Parliament and government to flex its muscles in those areas where it has competence. I think, I think there's an acceptance in Scotland that in areas like agriculture and fisheries, then there is a need for these common frameworks. I suppose the question is, in your view, is, is Scotland coming to the table to negotiate these common frameworks as equals, or, or is, 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 is the UK Parliament uh, in, in, in charge of these frameworks, and, and at the end of the day, who, who has the final say? I, I regard it uh, as, a, uh, as a partnership. The union is a partnership. Now, there are constitutional principles about where sovereignty ultimately lies, um, which are, are well understood. But day to day, week to week, year to year working, I believe, between um, the UK government and the Scottish and, for that matter, Welsh and, um, and Northern Ireland administrations, is, I believe, a partnership of equals. Um, and it's one from which uh, we in the UK government can, can learn sometimes, the Scottish government whether it's, you know, whatever the political um, complexion it may have, uh, will do things that we in the UK government might want to uh, listen and learn from. More than that, um, it's in the nature of the fact that when it comes to fisheries, that um, um, uh, uh, more than a majority of the fish caught in UK waters are caught by Scottish boats and landed in Scottish uh, ports. It's, it is the case that um, if you think about the, the landscape of the United Kingdom overall, some of our most um, important habitats and also some of our most important um, food production sectors are in Scotland. We can't have, I believe, a successful UK uh, food strategy or farming strategy without treating Scotland as, as an equal. Two, two things which I'm sure everyone around the table appreciates is that two of our single biggest exports from the UK are uh, salmon and whisky. 
Um, both of them depend on making sure that we have a proper respect for um, uh, Scotland's unique needs. And part of that, particularly when it comes to, for example, salmon, is making sure that we have the right environmental standards as well. OK. You finished, Mr. Rowe. Thank you very much. Uh, a supplementary from Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning, Mr. Gove. Just on the tensions between uh, the, the governments about powers, um, I think it boils down to uh, the, the powers that are in the bill just passed at uh, Westminster, at, uh, Section 15, that basically gives a period of time during which the UK government can uh, take a different view and enforce that different view over Scotland. Now, this morning, you've come across as a very reasonable man, and we know you've good relationships with Scottish ministers, and I accept that. How do you think those powers might be exercised? Because I think that is the area of tension that there might be at the moment between the parliaments and indeed between ministers. I completely understand that. And, and one of the things that I, um, I do understand as well is that my colleague David Liddington tried and sought uh, to ensure that there would be um, um, a shared understanding. And, of course, there was a, a difference of opinion, and I respect that, between the view of the Scottish Government and David Liddington's view about how the, the EU withdrawal bill legislation should eventually uh, take shape. And, and David's view was that there may be circumstances um, in which uh, the UK Government has to act in order to safeguard the, um, uh, the, the safe workings of the Union. My view... Um, is that uh, I can understand why that power is there. I think that my cabinet colleague was right. But uh, notwithstanding the, the different interpretations about what the best way forward was in that legislation, what we should do, what my job is to do, is to try to build trust daily, weekly, monthly between the UK government and the devolved governments as we leave the European Union. So even though that power is there, it needn't be, I hope it won't be, exercised in the way that some have uh, feared. So I won't say that the, uh, what's the word, uh, the concerns are, uh, you know, I understand the sincerity with which they're held, but I hope that we can prove um, that we want to make sure that the, the Scottish Government is fully involved in all the conversations that we need to have to make our exit work, even if we disagree over what our eventual destination should be outside the European Union. Nevertheless, in the in the day-to-day -day practical arrangements that we have, um, I want to make sure we work together as, 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 as well as we possibly can. A supplementary now from Angus MacDonald. Yes, uh, convener. Uh, Mr Gove, I've been listening closely to uh, the assurances that you're giving uh, this morning, uh, and I'm certainly intrigued by your assertion that we have a partnership of, of equals. Um, given the comments made by Liz Truss yesterday, uh, which put in doubt whether there's a collective responsibility in the UK government, uh, at all. Uh, how can we take anything uh, that you're telling us today as gospel? Well, I don't think you should take anything that I say as gospel, uh, because um, by definition, um, I'm not an apostle or a disciple. Um, and so therefore, I'm not Matthew, Mark, Luke or John, I'm just Michael. I'm not even Saint Michael at that. No, I think um, uh, uh, all liberty aside, um, uh, you should judge um, us as a government by our actions. And uh, the, the, the key thing I would say is if, if, we, if we look back over the course of the last year, um, while, for example, Mr Ewing and Mr Cunningham and I uh, might, might, might take different views on, on different issues, we've worked together and we've sought to work together collaboratively. Take a case in point. Um, um, Minister Ewing is, is, is quite rightly concerned about the operation of um, the discard ban on hate in the, uh, uh, with respect to the Scottish fleet. And he's been working with my colleague George Eustace and myself in order to make sure that we can have a common view towards the European Commission and that in the run-up to the December uh, Fisheries uh, Council that we can get the EU position to change. And it's Fergus who's raised this issue. He's absolutely right to. We want to work with him. It affects the Scottish fleet more than anyone, but we believe that we have a responsibility to act. Um, and I hope that uh, Fergus would, would say that, uh, uh, you know, whatever else, that uh, when he does raise these concerns, we do everything that we can to make sure that we respect them and work together. OK, thanks. I appreciate that, um, um, Mr Gove. Um, we've covered a wide range of subjects this morning, but given that you've just mentioned uh, fisheries, I wonder if we could briefly look at wild fisheries, specifically uh, Atlantic salmon populations. Now, we know that a decline in Scotland's native salmon populations continues, um, and yes. 
there's clearly the intergovernment, intergovernmental organisation, NASCO, the North Atlantic Salmon Conservation Organisation, which has done some good work with regard to recent uh, pharaohs and Greenland fisheries closures. However, our membership of NASCO is via our membership of the EU. So can you tell me, um, does our membership of NASCO continue via the EU during the transition period? And what are the UK government's intentions with regard to longer term membership of NASCO? Well, you're absolutely right that during the transition period, all the, the legal obligations and relationships that the UK has with other parties continue as before. That's the, the purpose of the, um, uh, the transition period, you're quite right in, in, in mentioning. Once we leave, then we want to continue membership of NASCO, we want to continue membership of uh, regional fisheries management organisations in order to ensure that we can manage stocks in a sustainable way. And you're absolutely right. There are concerns about the future of um, uh, uh, salmon, and uh, they relate partly to climate change, and they relate partly to also some, uh, in some cases, agricultural practices in some particular countries. But it's critical that we all work together. Um, Scotland, Norway, Iceland, other concerned nations, in order to ensure that salmon stocks are sustainable in the future. And NASCO is critical to that. You're absolutely right. Thank you. Much. I now move to the next question, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener, and good morning to you, Mr. Gove. Um, I'd like to oh. um, uh, dig a little deeper into the, uh, uh, the structure of the um, environmental principles. Uh, and yes. uh, as you'll be aware, but just for the record, very briefly, um, this wasn't in the uh, initial uh, European withdrawal bill, as you'll know. And then there was a Lords Amendment which was rejected, as I understand it, by, um, by the Commons. Um, and there was then an amendment, a new amendment, if I'm following it rightly, requiring the Secretary of State within six months uh, to publish uh, a draft bill in relation to the set of environment principles and certain duties uh, on the Secretary of State to publish statements and, and to deal with um, enforcement arrangements. Um, these environmental principles are extremely important to this committee and, of course, um, uh, across the UK. Uh, and uh, very, very quickly, the, um, uh, my, myself and Mark Ruskell and others um, took forward these issues in our own um, uh, backstop, as I would call it, continuity bill in relation to precautionary principle and, and other issues. So um, given the amendment um, on the maintenance of environment environmental principles that now stand, what are the plans to ensure compliance in this section and does it apply to the Scottish, uh, to Scottish devolved competencies? Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, you, 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 you um, if I may say so, you did a very, um, uh, you did a great job in clarifying what's been a uh, complex legislative process to get us to this point. And you put your finger on uh, the most important thing, which is that there are certain principles that have developed during our time in the European Union and which have a place it in, in, in different locations in the development of European Union uh, regulation and legislation, different principles that we need to ensure apply as we leave the European Union. Things like the precautionary principle or the polluter pays principle. Um, what we intend to do is to bring forward legislation in accordance with the amended EU withdrawal bill to set up um, a new environmental governance body, a new um, uh, watchdog to replicate uh, the functions that the European Commission had, and at the same time to lay out in primary legislation these principles and to say uh, that the UK government must every year produce a policy statement outlining how it intends to give effect to all of those principles. And the position that I've taken with respect to the, um, uh, the devolved administrations is, I hope, an accommodating one, which is that um, I am... A, open completely to thinking from uh, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland about how our shared commitment to these principles and to appropriate governance should uh, be given effect at a devolved level. And my view is that I have no prior preference as to how we do it. The important thing is that we need to give all our citizens a reassurance that these principles will be respected. But that, that's encouraging, Mr Gove. Uh, what I'm wondering is you say you have no prior um, view as to how, how that should be developed, but um, are you able to make a commitment today to um, the Scottish Devolved Administration that you do plan to consult and perhaps even that the arrangements for the consultation will be done in partnership? That's a very fair point, yes. Um, I, I, uh, my, my view is 
that um, we've got to make this work across the United Kingdom, and I will do everything I can to work with the Scottish Government in order to make sure that, that uh, an ambition which I believe that we share can be given effect in a way that respects the devolution settlement. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr Rowley, do you want to come in at this question or Thank not? You. Right. Thank you very much. Are you finished, uh, Ms? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we now move to question. Uh, the next question, uh, Mark Ruskell. Mr Ruskell, please. Could perhaps just, just follow up on that, uh, those answers to that last question. I mean, could you say a little bit more about what form the independent body for upholding environmental standards is likely to take? And perhaps the, the critical question here is what, what teeth will it have to hold governments to account? Well, we, we think it will have considerable teeth. It will have the capacity to um, uh, enforce compliance with the law. Uh, if it's the case that uh, uh, government is found in, in any respect, let's say with respect to air quality, for example, to be operating in a way which is in breach of the law, initially that body would uh, uh, have the power to issue advisory notices. But ultimately, it would have the power to take the government to court um, and to ensure that we were... Uh, if we were in error, brought into line with the the um, with the law. It's also the case that we envisage that this body should also have the power to uh, conduct investigations and to issue reports. What we want to do is to make sure that all of the um, the necessary disciplines that have grown up during the time that we've been in the European Union and that have been exercised through the institution of the Commission and also the ECJ can be replicated. There are analogies, parallels also with bodies like the uh, New Zealand Parliamentary uh, Commissioner for the Environment. Uh, he or she has the, uh, the capacity to launch investigations, hold ministers to account um, and to make sure that government doesn't backslide on its environmental commitments. OK, that, that sounds quite wide ranging, but perhaps I could focus you on one area of government policy. I mean, an area where you have faced repeated uh, court appearances alongside the Scottish Government has been in relation to air quality uh, and, and the, exactly. failure, the failure really to tackle legally binding European air quality limits. Um, let's take a government decision, say that the decision this week to expand Heathrow Airport by building a third runway. There's an argument there, a strong argument this will impact on air quality. It will uh, you know, impact on the ability of the government to meet those legal air quality standards. Do you believe that this new body should have the power to call in or even reverse a decision like that? No, I don't. And I think you're absolutely right to say that um, uh, the decision to authorise a third runway or to support a third runway at Heathrow, or in, indeed any decision to expand airport capacity, will have uh, air quality considerations that we need to take into account. And I should say, actually, that the biggest challenge is not so much the aviation, it's the ground transport in and around an expanded Heathrow that will pose the biggest air quality challenges, though I think that we can um, more than meet them by um, um, changing the way in which people travel to and from a hub airport like Heathrow. But I think that uh, when it comes to calling things in, um, th that, that there is a planning process. That planning process is well understood. I think this environmental watchdog could offer advice about how planning processes might change in the future and how they could be improved. Um, but I don't think that uh, this body should second-guess individual planning decisions. But what it can do is that it can, if government is, as you quite rightly point out, in breach of its legal obligations, it can say to government, sorry, you do need to, and it's time that you did, face up to the law and act in accordance with it. So you, wouldn't be you don't believe that that power should be extended to individual decisions that government makes about development or policy which could be making an air quality problem worse? It, 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 should con it should extend to policy decisions that government makes, but it shouldn't extend to individual planning decisions. That's a, an important distinction because there are already, and there should be, protections in planning uh, uh, law um, and in planning procedures in order to make sure that environmental considerations and air quality considerations, of course, are a subset of that, are met. Surely the proof here is in the pudding, isn't it? I mean, if, if Heathrow... Third runway gets built, there are major air quality problems in the surrounding area, yeah. and it's proven to, to not be successful. The mitigation measures that have been put into the, the planning development have not been successful. That's an error on the part of government. What, what redress can be brought to that situation? What role could this body have then in, in challenging the pathway that government's chosen? Well, I think to take uh, Heathrow as a case in point, um, the, the uh, approval will depend 
on satisfying certain uh, legal principles. Um, and those legal principles on air quality and on uh, uh, habitats protection are very clearly laid out. So the, 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 the uh, application, the development will only go ahead if it respects existing environmental uh, provisions. And if it is the case that the operator uh, is breaking the law with respect to environmental or other provisions, then appropriate steps can be taken. But I think it's important to draw a distinction between uh, the planning process, between um, development control or what might happen after a planning application has been granted, um, and also the prior uh, purpose of a body like this, which is to make sure that the, the government overall acts in accordance with the law in the way in which it operates. What, what discussions have been held then with, you, with the devolved administrations about a UK governance uh, process? Well, we, I outlined um, at meetings with um, uh, ministers representing all of the devolved administrations our approach towards environmental principles and governance. Um, and the, the, the point I made, similar to the point that I made to uh, Claudia earlier, is that um, I am, uh, I hope in the best sense of the word, agnostic about whether or not we have a UK-wide body or we respect um, the devolution settlement and that there should be um, uh, uh, watchdogs that operate uh, at, a, uh, at a devolved level. And my view is that um, uh, we should work together. I won't attempt to uh, second-guess or lead Scottish ministers towards a particular conclusion. I'm happy to work together in order to give effect to whatever they think is the best way of making sure that we can all collectively... Um, meet the expectation that I think our, our citizens have to maintain these standards. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we now move uh, to Mr Stuart Stevenson, who's got a couple of questions. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, Mr Gove, it, my colleague uh, Angus MacDonald introduced one uh, pan-European body. Uh, there are a number of others uh, that are part of the EU and some of which are not. European Environment Agency, Euratom, European Chemicals Agency, mm. European Maritime Safety Agency are just some of those which this committee might be interested in. Uh, what are the UK's government's plans and beliefs for future membership with or collaboration with uh, these bodies in future? Because Monsieur Barnier is trying to make some fairly discouraging uh, statements in this regard. How do you respond? Well, uh, the, the, the Mr. Bar Monsieur Barnier is a, is a tough negotiator on behalf of the uh, EU27 and reflects the Commission's position accurately at this stage in the negotiations. You ask about a, a range of agencies. There are some agencies that we've said that we would like to have associate membership of, and there are some arrangements like, for example, um, our relationship with Euratom, where we've laid out how we believe um, uh, the future could work. We've said as a government that we would like to be part of the uh, European Chemicals Agency, the European Medicines Agency, the European Aviation Safety Agency, um, on an associate membership uh, basis. We believe that's in uh, the EU's interest as much as in our interest as well. Uh, as these negotiations go on, we'll, we'll, we'll see um, how the EU respond. Um, but I think it's, it's fair to say that the position that uh, either the EU uh, 27 may take um, uh, uh, or individual member states may take at this stage in the negotiations isn't necessarily a position they'll take at the end. We've seen constructive movement during this negotiation process by Ms. Barnier on everything from uh, scaling down the amount of uh, contributions that he wanted from the UK uh, after we left the EU through to the governance arrangements for EU citizens after we've left the EU as well. So one shouldn't necessarily take the, the opening bid or the opening statement as a, as a thick red line. Uh, nonetheless, there are some areas where it's clear the UK government wants to make its own arrangements and uh, yes. that's perfectly reasonable. So what progress is being made in establishing replacement bodies uh, that will assume responsibilities currently exercised for environmental issues and fundamentally uh, what involvement has the Scottish Government had in that process so far? Well, you're absolutely right. There are some areas where either existing AM, uh, agencies in the UK will take on additional responsibilities um, or uh, there'll be the, the need for uh, new infrastructure. Uh, my approach has been to the Scottish Government um, and to all the devolved administrations twofold. One, to lay out bit by bit, um, our proposals, but also to, to say to them that I'm more than happy 
for um, the, uh, the Scottish Government to say to me, look, we know what it is that you want to achieve, or we know what it is that's actually in the interests of Scotland. We believe the best thing to do is X. And I'm happy to look at any proposition or proposal um, on a pragmatic basis. If, purely for the sake of argument, um, uh, Minister Ewing were to say that there were uh, particular responsibilities that he wished to see Marine Scotland exercise, and he believed that it would be better if they were to exercise them in this way or that way, then we would look at it entirely pragmatically in the interests of um, uh, Scotland's fishing fleet and uh, the health of Scotland's marine environment. Um, I think, Mr Gove, as I'm also a member of the Rural Committee, we may return to fishing in that context. Thank you. Thank you, of course. Um, and so, uh, largely, we draw now to uh, the end of the questioning um, that we had envisaged for you, Mr Gove. Um, we thank you very much. Um, indeed, I, I will with you. Uh, we thank you very much for your uh, positive and constructive approach today. But uh, before we finish, we just wonder if there's anything you might uh, wish to add um, to what um, you have already said. Um, by way of a conclusion, and I've just been passed a note by my clerk to say that maybe Angus MacDonald, before you do that, Angus MacDonald would like to ask a final, final question. Mr MacDonald. OK, uh, very much appreciated, convener. Uh, since we have you here, uh, Mr Gove, um, the issue of rewilding has been getting a lot of coverage uh, in, in recent months, uh, and I'm curious to hear what your views uh, on the reintroduction of the links uh, is and can you provide farmers on both sides of the border uh, with reassurances that if, if reintroduced, uh, it won't be to their economic detriment? Yes, um, I think. Or indeed that, uh, the detriment uh, of their own uh, livestock. Absolutely, the point is well made. Um, uh, like uh, Minister Cunningham, um, actually, um, I am always interested in the, the possibility of the uh, reintroduction or the. Uh, better provision of support for native species that um, uh, have either um, uh, disappeared or have come close to uh, extinction. Um, and one of the things that I've done south of the border is, of course, encourage, in a controlled way, um, in specific sites, the reintroduction of beaver. Uh, Lynx, however, lays a whole barrel load of other issues, of which I'm all too well aware. All I will say at this stage is, of course, it's for natural England as the uh, appropriate body to look at any application, but quite a high bar would have to be crossed. And um, one of the aspects of that bar would be exactly as you say, making sure that um, uh, local farmers um, felt confident that there would be uh, no economic or other damage as a result of the reintroduction. So as I say, that's a very, very high bar, but it's one that will be policed by an independent body, not by me. OK, thank you. All right, thank you. And if there being no further questions, is there anything you'd like to say finally before we hand over to the next committee? Uh, no, just to say thank you very much for the opportunity to give evidence. I'm grateful for the, 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 your flexibility in doing so. Um, and I hope, um, because I always enjoy um, visiting Scotland, that the, there'll be an opportunity for me to come and give uh, evidence to you again before we formally leave the European Union, if you'd like me to do so. And I'll do everything I can to make sure I can do that in person. Thank you very much, Mel. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. And we will uh, just uh, move um, now um, to the, the next part of our meeting. Um, and the committee uh, expects to meet on the 4th of September, and we will hear from stakeholders on its scrutiny of the draft budget for the 2019-20. And as agreed earlier, the committee will now continue in private session in committee room three. Uh, so again, our thanks to you, Mr Gove. Um, and that's uh, clear this meeting closed. No. We're moving into private session. Thank you.